All right, guys. Um, we've been having some serious tech problems. Apparently, um, Google Hangouts is having an issue. Uh, I'm actually just trying to make sure we can broadcast. Give me a minute. I'm going to get Mike back in here, and we're going to get everything going again. But you need to give me a minute because we're trying to figure a couple things out. Um, so one moment, please. Thank you. Have a stream. All right, guys. Um, we've been having some serious tech problems. In the All right, guys. I think we've got it. You just need to give me one extra second in order to verify that we are up and running in full. Um, I appreciate everybody who's been hanging on. Um, I just want to make sure that everything is running. Before we try and get our hopes up, we were doing a long conversation already, and I think it may be lost to the internet ether. <laughs> so you need to give me one moment while we do everything and get everything set up for this. Okay, the the actual we're actually uh, we're actually streaming at this point. Okay, I'm going to bring Mike back in here. So can you give me one moment? All right, and set everything up. Hey, Mike, we got you. You got, you me. got me. Okay, I think actually it seems to be running now. <laughs> we seem to be streaming. Everything looks like it's all good and pretty. Um, I just need to send out the new link to everybody so that we can do it. I wanted to make sure everything was streaming before I brought you in again. But what I found out is the apparently they're having downtime, as they call it, because apparently they're fixing something. Uh, so, so we were getting the butt end of the stick, but it would have been nice if they had made it a little more public that, hey, this, is, this service was going to be down. Chapter so, 5, we become Google's butt monkey. <laughs> <laughs> well said, sir. Well said. Okay. So, unfortunately, it looks like everything else that we were talking about is lost in the ether. So, we were going to um, either we can try and recap what we were saying, because at this point, I don't know. I was so busy trying to do tech stuff. Or we can just continue on from where we were talking about. We were talking about Becton Zero. Okay. Well, why don't we launch over it again? I mean, I'll talk about this a thousand times. I, I would love to hear you talk about it a thousand times. Uh, I haven't done it. <laughs> okay, so let's get going. Yes, please. So as uh, you may or may not know, this is indeed um, Mike Pondsmith of uh, Art House Rain Games. And if you don't know that, I feel very sorry for you. Uh, he is the head of uh, Art House Rain Games, creators of Cyberpunk. Uh, Cyberpunk version 3, Mecton, and in this case, we're going to be talking about Mecton Zero. And Mecton. What? Mecton. Mecton. Sorry. I keep, it's just the Jersey accent. I can't help it. <laughs> so we will be talking about all things Mecton. Yeah, that's so, better. Get that weight in there. Mecton. I, mean, you need to have, you gotta, I feel like you got to put the fist up and be like, Mecton. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm raising the metal fist right now. <laughs> I don't have that much metal. Um, I'm still kind of squishy and meaty, and meaty over here. So, um, okay, Mechton Zero, as we all know, or at this point we probably should know, is indeed up on Kickstarter. Um, it has been doing well. You made your Kickstarter go in three days? Two days. Two days. Two days and two hours. Two days and two hours. That's still pretty damn impressive. So, um, Mechton, Mechton, Zero on, is running on. <laughs> it's going to be running on interlock like we were talking about before, and you were talking about how um, you can still create your own mechs, but or a mecha, but um, you're going to have stuff pre-made for for the users and for the yeah. players. 
Why don't I get into that a bit? First of all, to allay everyone's worries, uh, Mekton Zero is not designed to replace Mekton Zeta or Mekton Zeta Plus. It's actually kind of a capstone to the two. Um, it's there to solve a few basic problems that people have had over the years in that Mekton right now, particularly Mekton Zeta, is a little like having to build your car before you decide to go down to the corner to the supermarket. You, know, you don't really want to have to run out there and pull a transmission out and put it back in and so forth. Well, that's essentially the problem you have with Mekton is you have to build the Mecca. So what we decided to do was to basically build Mecca for you using the systems in Mekton Zero, or sorry, in Mekton Zeta, and then bring them over to Mekton Zeta. In fact, what we're doing is we'll actually have the numbers and the calculations we used in Mekton Zeta in the back of Mekton Zero so you can see how we did it. Why did we do this besides making it easier? Um, one big reason is besides just getting it, something that people could play immediately, we also realize that when you have to build all the mecha in a world, the mecha do not have context. And what that means is you're putting a whole lot of mecha on a board and you have to figure out kind of how they fit in the world. One of the big points about Mekton Zero was that we wanted everything to integrate. We wanted it to flow together. And that meant actually keeping in mind design philosophies. And that meant we had to design them for you so things would add up. I'll give you an example. In the post-war period after World War II and going into the Korean War and then all the way through into the 80s, the United States and Soviet Union kept a kind of back-and-forth, tit-for-tat development battle between their jet fighters and bombers. So you would have the Century Series, which were all the F-100s, F-102, 103, whatever. And you would have the various MiG versions as well. All of those were done in a context of what the other guy was doing. You saw a threat, you countered it. And one of the goals we had in Mekton Zero was to basically show that kind of development curve and have you being able to pick up the mecha from that curve. Another cool thing is that that same period saw automakers jumping back and forth, one-upping each other in terms of their civilian models. And since Mekton Zero also involves civilian and non-military mecha as well as the military, we wanted to mirror the balance between Ford, Chrysler, and Toyota, and Volkswagen, and all that in the same way. So when you get Mecca, you're going to be able to customize them heavily, but you don't have to do all the heavy lifting of putting all the systems together, because we've done that for you. That's actually pretty awesome. I like that actual evolutionary scheme. It, uh, it kind of reminds me of you know how the Hellcats come in, and uh, everything else gets replaced as the war kept uh, going on and on. Exactly. Uh, you were also talking about the miniatures. Now, you were saying that you changed scales for this. Yeah, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, the idea with the miniatures has been that when we did 1-300s the old days, that's a lot of assembly. There's no way to do a miniature that large without it basically costing an arm and a leg and also meaning that you have to put a lot of parts on it. We noticed they broke and it was hard to keep them in place when you're gluing them. Um, we ended up having to pin a lot of ours, and you know we're the guys who made the darn thing, so we should know. So by going to instead of the one three hundred scale, which had been standard war game scale for armor and tanks, which are of course one or two piece units, we decided to go with the system that's being used for things like uh, the Gundam systems that are being done in Japan, which are one four hundred. So one four hundred, interestingly enough, for the mecha we're dealing with are going to come in to be around 28 millimeters or a little bit smaller, kind of up and down, which is about the size you're going to have for a standard gaming figure. And coincidentally, that size is both easier to cast. It's easier to have a lot of them on the board. You can treat your environment a lot more like you would a gaming environment. You know, when you're dealing with 1300, you got big tables. When you're dealing with 1400, tables can get smaller, and that's really nice. In addition, since we're going to be doing these in miniatures in lead rather than in plastic, it's also easier to paint them and get the mecha style you want. And since M0 is a lot about customization, we want people to be able to actually customize the suits and the colors they wanted and so forth. Uh, the change in scale came about because, interestingly enough, one of our um, 
vendors many, many years back when the people licensed to Mecton figures actually did me several sets of Mecton miniatures in the 1-400 scale just as an experiment. And I took them to games and found they were much, much easier to work with. They were easier to manipulate. They were easier for people to work ranges out. And oddly enough, they were more personal. And so when we started working on the miniatures for Zero, we decided to carry that forward. That's really awesome, actually. I think that uh, the one four hundred scale, I think, will look really, really snazzy. Um, I like to use my Monpoc figures with them. You know, Monster Apocalypse. I get the buildings out, and they work for the mecha, and I can just like stomp on things. Actually, you know, it, it brings to mind a really interesting question because Mechton does allow for the use of uh, combiner mecha. You know, mm-hmm. Voltron, or if you want to go with the um, Transformers version, you'd have like Devastator. Well, yeah. A- any chance we could see like linkable miniatures? I'm uh, working on that. Actually, we have several different types. We're going to basically, for people interested, we have the standard mecha. We also have one entire group has basically hover-based mecha. Then we also have animal form mecha, and we're also going to have two new. Well, actually, uh, combiners like you mentioned, and another form that we just designed, which we call basically. Um, suit mecha. I guess it's the best way of putting it. Combinatorials. Essentially a suit that is not all combined but rather goes into a larger suit structure. And so essentially it's able to uh, power itself up along with other mecha. It's something that hasn't been mucked with before and we're kind of looking forward to it. Kind of reminds me vaguely of like the headmasters. A little bit but on a mecha size scale. So, for example, when the bad guys are kicking in the bank down at, you know, the, the local um, small city you're in, you may have five cop cars, but when they combine, rather than having a straight-on combiner, what they're doing is moving into an assault unit, and that frame, as we call it, will essentially be there for all of them to hook in and power up. So there's no battle about who gets to form the hit anymore. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. Um as uh, Mechaton is very mecha-based, and a lot of people use things like Gundam as a as a point of view, or even you know um, Armor Trooper Voltoms, where it's a case of you have these large scale battles. Are there going to be specialized rules to allow people to more easily perform those kind of huge battles and those epic uh, epic turns of the story? Yeah, one of the things we're doing is we've adapted a system um, that we used earlier called Mechton in the movie, but with a much deeper system to drive it. Um, It takes too long to fight a mecha combat, and there's a lot of bookkeeping. We simplified that. Another thing we did was we added the concept of katas, and what katas do is they allow you to compress various types of moves into single actions. Um, you always wonder why somebody yelled, you know, um, running death past beam saber. Now we have a reason why they do that and how it works. Um, in the same way, um, we wanted to reduce the size of the miniatures to allow mass units. Our theory is that basically a Mekton game should work on a squad base level, whether it's for a team, a military group, a police group, um, a civil defense unit, or as in the case of a couple games I was running earlier, a bunch of guys who are cowboys on the range with Mecha. Oh, kind of like the whole Galaxy Rangers thing. Yeah, uh, actually I had a rather successful campaign where yeah, a couple people were essentially uh, herding the equivalent of Algolian Apatosauruses around and fighting off all kinds of really big nasty creatures that look like they staggered out of Pacific Rim. So you're, you're protecting your dinosaurs with rail guns, and wearing and wearing heat ponchos to keep yourself from freezing as you fight your way across the glaciers. That sounds really epic, actually. Yeah, That's we have an entire. To get in on. We have an entire section of a module area that we're going to be putting together for that. One of the things we're doing with Zero is we're also designing it around different areas of activity. So you don't have to always be in the military fighting. You don't even have to be in the military. Um, a current campaign right now. Uh, all the players are essentially um, owners of a vast trade combine that has four or five different subunits, kind of like Stark Industries. And in fact, one of the players is playing kind of the equivalent of Tony Stark. 
and all of their Mecca are basically their Lamborghinis and Maseratis because they're all very rich and very flashy and have playboy lifestyles. So they're not doing a lot of fighting, but occasionally they run across something where having a giant robot with 15-foot-long claw arms is very useful. <laughs> okay, well, you know what? We're actually talking a lot about Al Gol in the setting, and I, I'm sure we've got some viewers who are maybe vaguely familiar with it. Would you mind giving us like the like a, a nice quick view of the overall backstory of the Mechaton universe? Uh, yeah, actually, it's kind of funny. Is I was talking to my son about this the other day. Mechaton core universe actually goes back to my first D and D world, which was a world called Telmar, which took place in an archipelago planet settled by people who had crash landed there. So when I wanted to do Mechaton, I looked at it and I said, "Hmm, what can we do here? Oh, well, I got to use an archipelago. They're great because I can have something happen on every single island, and it can always be different." I call this the Route 66 factor. Every week in the old TV show, Route 66, they were traveling, they'd come to some town somewhere in the middle of bum nowhere, and they'd get into trouble, have to get out, and then they'd go to the next town. Well, same thing in, in Algol, you can go to different islands. So what Algol is, is basically an archipelago water world with two large continents on the either pole, a couple smaller kind of Australia continents scattered on the, on the equator, and this, this has been settled by a group of colonists who have been running from an attack of aliens that kind of resemble super intelligent velociraptors. And they end up landing there, and for a while they've settled down, and then the bad guys, the again, they find them and blow their civilization back to the Stone Age. The only thing they have surviving are mechtons, which are the enormous fighting mecha that were used during this vast interstellar conflict. And when we pick up the story, many, many generations have passed, and people have just really learned how to reactivate and utilize this technology. The great part about Algol is that the entire thing is set around the idea of a world that, where giant robots are really common. Um, I liken them to being as common as light aircraft, for example. Um, basically, I asked when I started writing this world, what would happen if everybody could have a giant robot? What if they were as common as, you know, airplanes or cars or helicopters? And if you had enough money, you could get one. Well, would you use it to fight wars? Not necessarily, you know. Um, the other day I was watching someone tearing down a tree in the neighborhood. They had to go remove a tree from a power pole. And I looked at all the machines they brought in to cut this tree down and things to hold it and stuff to cut it and guys with trucks and there were 15 guys around and people handling this. I said, if I had a 30-foot tall mecca, I would walk over, I would grab the tree with one arm around it, I would pull out my chainsaw and cut the vice of the tree off, pick up the tree, and I would carry it somewhere and dump it. And then an hour later, if I wanted to plant a new tree, I'd get a really big shovel, and I'd walk over and say, the hell with the backhoe, I'd dig a hole. But of course, <laughs> since I'm 30 feet tall, the hole's going to be enormous. And I realized that Mecca had a lot of usefulness in more than a military concept. And so a large part of Algol is a fairly high-tech environment where these Mecca are used practically everywhere. See, that kind of reminds me of um, actually one of the things that you put into, I believe it was the Soldier of Fortune 2 book, where you had walkers and you introduced the walker concept into the cyberpunk universe. Yep. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, that's really cool. And it was really funny because like out of nowhere, there's like, and by the way, here's the Volkswagen walker and it, it's like a two-seater. And it's like, if you just have to have a walker in a civilian setting, here you go. <laughs> well, it was... It was one of the things that bugged me. In fact, it, I love Gundam, but it's one of the things that's always bugged me with Gundam is in Gundam, I've seen exactly two civilian mobile suits in the entire time I've watched all the versions of the series. Yeah. Everything's military. And I'm thinking, yeah, if I had a space colony and I had to move big things and build buildings and stuff like that, I'd have these things all over the place. It'd be, so, Amro, yeah? Why don't you go on down and pick up that wall over there, bring it over, and uh, Frau Bo will use this gigantic hammer and nail the building together. Why the hell not? I used to look at Gundam and go, why aren't they using these things? 
I'd be using them. Well, I mean, in some respects, it wasn't that what the balls were for. I mean, the, the little space balls that had like little two manipulator arms and a cannon on top. But uh, <laughs> they, they, not they, really. like they, they were did kind not. Of engineering. They're, eventually, they came with the petite mobile suit, which shows up a little bit in Gundam Zeta, and that's one of the things I love about Double Zeta. It's one of the things I love about Double Zeta is that the petite mobile suit is there to say, yeah, you know, we we use these things for something else every so often. But I would kill to have an Anaheim Electronics catalog that had, you know, the equivalent of, and this year's model with some girl in a bikini next to it, you know, and some dude throwing a beach ball, you know, and seeing it. <laughs> so one of the cool the things, sun with your mobile suit. So yeah. one of the things I'm actually doing, we, we've already been sketching this out, uh, Mark Simmons and I have been talking a lot about it, and uh, Benjamin's in it as well, is we're going to do catalogs like that. We're going to actually have civilian mobile suit models for 1422. You know, and you're going to have those scenes with people on the beach and executives getting out of their high-class black, you know, Imran-covered mecca. Because it's just freaking cool. No, that does really actually sound really, really awesome. Um, so as the Kickstarter continues, what could we possibly expect for more stretch goals? Well, we discovered, and one reason we haven't directly posted them, like, all at once, we like to get feedback from people as to what they want to see. And much to our surprise, we thought people would be much more gung-ho about miniatures, and actually they are much more gung-ho about background and new characters and things like that. For example, okay. we were having Zonavir Ebenflax showing up. People got and danced in the streets, which kind of surprised us, and it's kind of cool. So we've actually been doing more in terms of background and missions and so forth. Um, the core projects we're doing are what we call episodes. And a way to think of Mekton Zero is uh, it's almost like a couple of series um, where the saga is basically a five-part series, five-part series, five-part series, five-part series. All of them interrelate. Characters go back and forth between them. They're all in the same time frame, generally. And with those um, expansions on the characters and the types of mecha they have, their backgrounds, what they're doing, um, their soap operas, one of the more fascinating things I loved was on several of the games we ran and then later ran and play test outside of Talsorian, was people started writing fanfic about characters. And... You know, for writer creator, that's a hoot. You know, even if it's bad fanfic, it's still funny to see what do with it. It is nice to see that level of involvement. I, it's really nice to see somebody go, you know, this is so cool. I'm gonna write my own stuff in their universe, and you know, hope that all goes well. <laughs> yeah, and I I think that that's one reason people you know should be should do this. They should get more involved in it. And what we want to do is offer people opportunity. What we're seeing is that the role-playing aspect has kind of been ignored in Giant Robots, and that's because it's almost always been a warfare story. But some yeah. of the best runs we've set up and designed have happened as police dramas, have happened as you know more than law enforcement. We had a medical team at one point running around Algol, you know, pulling people out of scrapes. It was like Thunderbirds with, with doctors <laughs> and Giant Robots. And and marionettes? Yeah, well, they're anime <laughs> characters, so if they're stupid, the animation is bad. Super anime marionation. Yeah, I kind of like it. That, that I, I, think, like I think we should do it, yeah, yeah. I think this sounds like this is something you should work on. Jerry, Jerry Anderson is turbo-propping in his grave right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did get a question from somebody asking, what happened to Quicksilver Blues? Quicksilver Blues is a project that a friend of ours designed. Um, we're basically trying to concentrate on what's going on in the Algol world, and at some point we may look at Quicksilver again, but it's never been an official Talsorian project. It's just simply one that, like I said, a good friend, Jim Milligan, has been working on for some time. Um, okay. The problem you generally have is, and people tend to miss this, when you run a company, you get an awful lot of stuff, and a lot of that's even internal. Mm -hmm. But you have to keep a certain consistency, not just for you know what you want to do, but also for retail, for distribution, for people who are doing books or licensing, all that stuff. You know, it's important to remember that anything we do that's kind of off the mark, we have to explain to the guys who are 
doing translations in Italy and Japan and other places. We have to explain to people who might be writing books. We have to explain, you know, it's all got to be coordinated. Right. So at this time, we're pretty much committed to doing stuff for the Algol setting, and that means Mechdon Zero. Okay. I also had somebody ask, um, uh, okay, this one's sort of a long-winded question. I'm going to try and sort my way through it as I read it. Um, how about a heroic resolve mechanic to simulate the way in which a hero can use sheer willpower to transcend the limits of flesh and metal when it's all on the line and he's got nothing left but the desire to protect everyone slash achieve his destiny slash insert motivation of your choice? Uh, yeah, we call that hero points. I, I was going to say, isn't that already in the game? To some extent, but it becomes more nakedly uh, visible there. We have a really interesting experience system that kind of factors that in. Uh, one of the things I discovered was that people don't get the same kind of experience or want the same kind of game experience, and they don't necessarily want to do things in the same exact pattern. So we actually do have a structure where people can apply contacts and things they've learned or particular heroic abilities to a situation. It doesn't drive everything, but it's there. Well, I've always found Mechton to be a very good and flexible system, and, I, and I've always found one of the things, I think you put it in um, uh, Listen Up, You Primitive Screwheads, which is, this is a guideline. If you don't like something, just don't use it or throw it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm amazed at how many people think that they're going to have to write me and say, is it okay if I don't use this? You know, you bought it, take it home. You know, as long as you don't put my name on it, I'm pretty groovy with <laughs> it. Believe me, I've been modifying your games for years. <laughs> well, I like to say that you know Mark Miller did not hunt me down for modifying Traveler back when I bought it and started playing years ago. And if Mark didn't hunt me down, then you know I guess I'll let you guys have the same slack. <laughs> oh well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Mark's it's some companies spot. where you seem to have to run everything by. <laughs> nah, you know that's that's not the fun part. No, I, I find that. Certain people like to play a game certain ways, and if you allow them the flexibility to do so, um, they have a greater ownership of the game. Yeah, and also the great part is that games in many ways are interactive, and therefore they may want to change something. We may see it as a cool thing. Uh, case in point, the original Chromebooks did not directly come from... Hang on a second. I have to answer something here. Okay. Do what you got to Well, while Mike is answering those questions, or phone call as it may be... Um, I'm back now. I just had to tell them they get their own ride back. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm on a street corner and their mugger's coming. Down. Well, I gave you a gun. Shut up. <laughs> Roll a d10 for initiative and see what happens. Yeah, hey, this is a night city. Come on, quit complaining. <laughs> I don't know. It is Seattle. It's kind of night and it's kind of raining all the time. Yeah, actually, it's one of those bright, sunny days which happen about once in a blue moon, which I can now see outside my window. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question. Do you mind shifting gears for a second? We can talk sure. about uh, Cyberpunk uh, 2077? 2077. All right. So, as we all know, 2077 is in the works, and we've seen the, the trailer for it, which um, oh, I... so sexy. Oh, my God. And mocap for that... Yeah, this is what it yeah. looked like. Multiple cameras. I saw. I saw a. Uh... You saw the rig for it. Yeah. yeah what cracked me up was I was talking to the guys about it because I was in Internet Studio a little while, about two months earlier. Is they were telling me that the woman who they actually mocap for it, they met her on a bus and convinced her to go actually do the entire mocap session. And wow. I'm going. So, so what you're saying is girls like that are walking around? Well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but I, um, the mocap they did was just incredible. And, you know, I work in this area, so look at the things they were able to do. Many people would not see the level of work that was involved in the 2077 trailer. I could see that, and then on top of it, they had the time to put in all these wonderful little weird shout-outs. You know, there were things I, I would look down an alleyway and way in the back scene and go, oh my god, that's a poster out of the original game. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I love about CDPR guys is they played cyberpunk 
when they were in high school. They like it. They know it. They didn't want to do something else. They wanted to do cyberpunk. The first week I was there, they were saying things like, we're going to have to have Alton here because she's really great. Johnny Silverhand can do this, and of course, Morgan. And I'm thinking, okay, this is the first time with any of the many companies who talked about this where they were as excited about having the characters as I was. Well, you know what? You bring up a really good point because, first of all, I, I love the fact that all cutting him in, in the background, uh, yes. uh, one of the shots. But um, bringing up, you know, Morgan Blackhand and Alt and uh, Johnny, I gotta ask: it, Can can you let us know if, if any of these characters will actually appear in the game? Uh the odds are probably pretty good, for obvious reasons. Uh, I can't tell you how, though. Okay, that Is would there... be spoiling it. <laughs> I was going to say, are there any voice actors or actors that have signed on that we may know of that are going to be involved in the project, or is that, can't talk about it? Um, can't talk about it yet. Um, okay. I know there appears to be a, a group of people who are muttering about having me do some voiceover, but we'll see about that. Dude, I would love to see you do voiceovers. Hell, I'm so convinced that you did one of the voices for uh, the old uh, Mech Commander game. Actually, I did. Oh, good, that was you. That I'm was going, me. You know, that's really funny. It looks like Mike, and it sounds like Mike. It was me. I'm sitting in a Mech Commander helmet. I played the old guy. Yes. that's oh, You know what? Some <laughs> Somebody owes I, me 50 bucks. Well, good. You, you go collect it, because, yeah, I did that. I did Crazy Taxi and a bunch of others. I was the scratch voice guy at, at uh, Microsoft for a long time. Uh, my favorite, though, is when I actually, when I was working on Matrix Online, I got to do Morpheus. <laughs> That is awesome. Yes. Yeah, I remember. So, I remember you wearing that, uh, that Matrix T-shirt. In fact, I think I still have a copy of the photo of you, myself, and uh, Cameron Johnson, who is one of the Chrome Beret members mm -hmm. um, from the Playtest Icon. I think that was back in '05 or '04. Yes, it would have been in '05, '05 because yeah, that's when the project was rolling. Yeah, the thing about it is, is that I ended up doing a lot of VO stuff. But it's not my job, so I never really, you know, pursued it as a career, even though I have, have been a DJ back, you know, college years and just after. Yeah, it's really funny. I, I did radio back when I was in uh, college, so I, I, I kind of get you. Yep. That's <laughs> and, a hard and, life. And I worked in the film industry, so there's that too. Yeah, um, it's a hard life. It really is. Dude, if you want to talk about hard lives in, in, in the production industry, we could make that a whole podcast all in and of itself because I can tell you stories that would – I know you got a little white and a little gray going on. I can take it the rest of the way. Uh, I, I'll bring some of my friends from the industry, and they'll make your hair fall out. <laughs> what is this, like, like a one-upsman thing? Trust me. <laughs> these, these are people who've seen it all and live in fear now. Oh yeah, you're you're preaching to the choir. Um, so it, it's going to be kind of open world. Yes, yeah. The plan is this open world. Um, it's a very ambitious open world too. Having worked in MMOs and so forth, uh, I'm really impressed by what they plan to do. But I'm also impressed by the tool set. I've seen the tool set and what they're going to use. And you know, even if I wasn't doing the license. There are moments I go, God, I would work here just so I could use the stuff. Well, is there anything you can tell us about the tool sets? Um, well, part of the tool set came out of things you're using in Witcher 3, where I watched them once build an entire fortress, or sorry, an entire forest with a push of one button. Holy crap. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I just stepped through with my mouth open like, what's the processing time? Less than a minute. Wow. That's and if I told you any more, I, I would have to kill you in Polish. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I think that you would get a couple protests. A lot of cheers, but a few protests. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't be in Polish. Yeah, I guess. Um, I don't know who who would be doing the cheering and who would be doing the, uh, the booing. But, um, I don't know, but I'll be taking bets. <laughs> what man. I do. Just crush me under your heel, why don't you? But yeah. okay, so I think you'll win. <laughs> so are we? Uh, are we going to be seeing this maybe from a third-person point of view, like an over-the-shoulder thing, or is this going to be like more like a um, a first-person thing, sort of like Deus Ex? Uh, I can't really tell you on that one. Um, that's one of those ops keep secret for now. Okay. 
we'll 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 see it when it gets there. Yeah. Is there any chance that there's more trailers coming out anytime soon so we can, you know, keep our uh... most probably yes. Okay. They they like to show things off. Okay, that's good. It keeps our uh, keeps our whistle wet. Yeah. And besides which the team that did the trailer just won a Clio for advertising, so I, I think they want to do more stuff. That's good. Yeah. That's good. yeah. Um Okay, are you are do you feel up for talking about other things other than Mechaton and uh and uh, Cyberpunk 2077? Yeah, sure. Okay. I do actually have a question that involves a rules clarification. Um, oh, God, no. I can't do rules clarifications that often on the rule because I don't have all the tools here. People have to remember, I wrote, God, eight, nine games. I don't keep all the rules in my head. I have to look them up, too. See, I think this is just one that you might know just because it's it's simple, but it's, it's like apparently a major one, and I think I had the same problem, too. Sure. Okay. So if you, let's see if you know this right off the top of your head. Um, in Cyberpunk 2020, if you get shot in the head, do you take the BTM modifier off before or after you double? Uh, you take the BTM modifier off before you double. Wow, I have, I think that 50 bucks I'm supposed to collect, I'm going to have to pay back out again. <laughs> Basically, BTM is essentially, if you think of it this way, the Hulk has very high BTM. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. The BTM essentially is resistance to the bullet getting through and a number of other things like that. Mm -hmm. And after that, the, the assumption is your head was not hard enough and the damage got into it and then it proceeded to tear your brain apart. Got it. Okay. Um, let's see here. I guess we can just start going down, down the list because these are a lot of really good questions and they're all sort of all over the place. Um Out of all the various properties that you have produced over the years, which one stands out as your all-time favorite? Hmm. Gee, that's like saying which child I like the most. Uh, I only have one. Yeah, I do, and he'll kill me. Um, <laughs> I the like problem, the dog better. The problem is I like them all for different reasons because they all do different things and they're all kind of like fast as my personality. I love Cyberpunk because of the depth and complexity of the world and the fact that it's sort of like my flip side, my night side. Mm -hmm. But my light side is Mekton. So I'd say basically between the two of them, those are two of my faves. I like Castle and I kind of enjoy wandering through the world, but it isn't by entirely by nature um, the world I mentally live in. You know, I can live in a world of giant robots. I can live in a world of people with power armor arms. Um, Castle, Castle has a lot of elements of how how will I do this? How will this experiment work? You know, it's a beautiful world. Um, but as I like to kid, I wrote Castle originally for my wife Lisa because you know she's kind of and you do a lot of grim stuff. <laughs> well, for those keeping track at home and playing the home version, uh, when he says Castle, he's referring to Castle Falkenstein. Yeah. Well, you refer to Castle, and I'm sitting here going, "Oh, yeah, oh, 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 I, oh, I can Castle Valkenstein." Yeah. yeah, yeah. Castle Valkenstein essentially um, it has a kind of interesting check in history because the original system was designed uh, under a game I called uh, Palace Intrigue for my wife, and then I was sitting around. We had just gone to Neuschwanstein, and we had just wandered around looking at stuff, and we had gone down the lake and you know, all the areas where Ludwig had been, and I just had this idea of what if Ludwig hadn't died, what would have happened? And next thing I know, I whipped out this napkin and a red pen and started writing Castle Falkenstein on it. I saw the napkin around here somewhere. So yeah, Castle Falkenstein <laughs> literally was one of those moments where you write it on the back of a napkin, and your wife's looking at you going, do you have an idea again or what? And you go, yeah. yeah. I've got this crazy stuff. What if Ludwig doesn't die? What if the king of the elves saves him? And she said, sounds cool, which is why I married her, because, well, I married a woman who would hear that and say, sounds cool. Yeah, I, I married my wife for the similar reason. It was kind of a case of uh, we would go out someplace, and I'd be like, oh, my God, I have this great idea for a board game. And she'd be like, oh, God, again? How many of these stupid things are you going to make? And I'm like, I don't know, until my head's empty. So, honestly, I'll probably be producing these, and I'll be on my deathbed, and I'll be like, I've got this great... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's about the size of it. My my wife claims that you know even as I'm wrapping a project, I'm writing a new project, and she's amused by that. But uh, the interesting part is, yeah, she's always amused by it. I think because she was a gamer from the moment I met her. I didn't have to sell her on gaming. I actually had to horn swoggle my way into her game and get rid of her old boyfriend who was the GM, so I could be next to her. <laughs> you know what the funny part is? I actually still remember that story from when we all went to Gen Con. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and it's the God's given truth. In fact, she actually recounted it in something recently, in a book or something. I'm always oh, really? excited. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. Um, let's see here. Okay, moving right along with... Uh, you know what, considering we're actually talking about uh, Castle Falkenstein, I, I got several people asking, can we see a reprint? Um, yeah, we're working on that, but uh, we have the other two main books to deal with first. Falk still is around. We actually had done a reprint, and it was out, and basically where we are right now is we have so many projects to cut up on that Falk is probably going to be third on the list. Probably TFOS will come after that. So, you know, we have a lot of projects to get caught up on. So, Cyberpunk is definitely on the road? Uh, we're going to have to do some updates. But well, the updates are basically to tie things together after what happened in the fourth corporate war. Okay. I like okay, to so put it together we're as... We're moving with um, the, uh, the chronology from V3. Right, but we're doing that by modules, not a whole new book. Okay. All right, you know, so... We have, for example, a new Chromebook that's coming out this year, and it essentially, as we call it, is the uh, Survivor's Guide to the Corporate War Chromebook. And it'll explain a lot about what happened and give you a lot of really interesting technology that most people don't think of when they think of cyberpunk. Will that be a hard copy, or is it going to be a PDF? Yeah, hard copy and PDF. We do everything that way now. You will have to send me a copy. I will. You can play test it. I would be more than happy to do that, man. I got people here who would who would like drop trow immediately in order to get in on that. Uh, don't tell me about that. <laughs> I try not to. I'm trying to unhear that. <laughs> Once you have heard it, you cannot unhear it. Brain bleach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes in the ear, but it stays there. Um, okay. Um, here's actually a very interesting question. Um. Do you think that cyberpunk as a genre, not necessarily your game, but the genre, is still relevant in this day and age? Yeah, actually it is. It's more relevant. In fact, the more I look at things day to day, the more cyberpunk they look. Um, part of the thing is that just because the technology catches up, the sociology doesn't necessarily catch up in a visible way to people. But we now live in a world where corporations dominate tremendously, and that our government is in many ways subservient to that corporate interest, as are many national governments, and where there's a tremendous amount of technology being used against people, and a lot of people using the technology in turn against their governments, their corporations, and so forth. So every day is more cyberpunk. I get up in the morning and I go, gee, I wish I wasn't as right as I am sometimes. It's actually something that I've actually noticed is I, as I grew up playing your games, because I got into cyberpunk with like, and really started understanding it as more than just, oh, cool, I'm this guy who's got this gun and this cybernetic arm, and I can see in the dark, and I'm going to shoot this guy through a wall with a micro-missile launcher that I happen to be keeping up my arm. Um, and I started looking at like the actual ethics and sociological quandaries of it. I've actually been noticing, you know, you have soldiers for hire, you know, with... Um, uh, was it the not Blackrock? Um, Z and Blackwater. Blackwater, thank you. Yeah. I kept going with Blackrock, and Blackrock is an investment firm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like you, you got Blackwater, Z, you've got all that going on. You know, you have corporations basically hamstringing um, uh, the government into doing what they want. You know, it, it's it, it does kind of come up there, yeah. You know, let me tell you a story uh, without getting into some names. Um, at a convention many, many years ago, not that many years ago, but at least about nine, ten years ago, I met a gentleman who, uh, when we started talking, you know, at the con and so forth, it developed that that's what he did. He was essentially someone who hired mercenaries for corporations in foreign countries and built tactical units, and he congratulated us on how good we were at figuring out what was going on. 
And I took that away as, oh, so I really just met Morgan Blackhand. <laughs> it's almost like you're uh, pulling either a Rage Bartmoss or uh, Thompson. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, like I said, no names are mentioned. And it was a few right. years back. But, yeah, um, the thing about cyberpunk is that I don't think it grows old. I think what happens is... Um, people tend to think of it as just a technology until they look at it in a deeper way. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I found is that there's a subtle difference between the technology driving cyberpunk and how cyberpunk is really driven by the people stories and how they use that technology. And this has been a big discussion that we've had with the CDPR guys. You know, we're kind of in agreement that it's always more important to tell the story than to have the technology exactly a certain way. It's how people use it. it. That line, the street finds its own uses for things, is very... Yeah, that was an old Gibson line. Old Gibson line, the master. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, is that um, I, I know one of the bigger complaints that people had was, you know, oh, well, now all the tech is old, and maybe the book should be rewritten so that all the tech gets updated. What is your thought on that? Um... Well, the problem is if you go too far, you end up with some of the problems we had when I did Cyberpunk uh, V3. V3 was now because of people telling me an awful lot that we had to update everything, we had to go take into account all the new Cyberpunk styles and everything. Well, what we hadn't realized when we were doing this was that that new generation Cyberpunk wasn't really Cyberpunk. It was transhumanism, which is a yeah. way of dealing with that technology. And... That was a mistake I think I made as I listened a little bit too much to those external voices without looking at what's the core happening here, what defines it as cyberpunk. And I decided from that point, you know, when I went back to cyberpunk, I wasn't going to make that mistake again. I'd listen to that inner voice for a change. And it isn't about how close the technology is to now. A large part of it is what we would do with that technology. Case in point, um, there are people out there now who are wearing cyber arms that are not that bloody different than Johnny Silverhand's cyber arm, except it's not chrome-plated. Oh, you're talking about that woman who uh, had her hands replaced recently. Right. And I looked at that and I said, yeah, that's pretty Johnny right there. Yeah. But her reasons for wearing it and what she would do with it are very different than Johnny's reasons. And that's where it jumps into cyberpunk. I don't think she got up in the morning and said, I think I'll cut my hand off because it'll make me more interesting or powerful. She said, thank God I have a hand. Yeah. So I her cyberpsychosis loss is zip. But if I choose to, for example, gouge my eye out and replace it with plastic, it's a different way of thinking about that technology. Could we actually see a rewrite of the actual rules regarding the reasons for getting the cyberware uh, as being part of the humanity loss? Um, no, but we're going to see a lot more other things that affect humanity loss. Um, one of the things that went down when I was working a lot more in video game stuff this last 10-year period, uh, one of my friends specializes in dealing with things like post-traumatic shock and so forth and designing games that are more teaching games. And we talked a lot about other ways that cyberpsychosis and humanity loss can be driven. And you're going to see that. Uh, coming up in the next guides and so forth. That's really good, actually, because actually one of the things that I know that I personally use, and I'm going to go a little bit off on a tangent here, is um, when I was running Cyberpunk, we would get a lot of people going, oh, well, you know, I could just shoot this guy in the head because it's Cyberpunk and nobody cares, and it'll be a case of, like, he's just another piece of street trash and no, no one will give it a second thought. And I'm sitting there going, first of all, for somebody who's supposed to be playing a revolutionary, that's really friggin' callous. Just to be like, hey, there's this guy in my way, and I'm just going to blow his brains out. Especially when you're supposed to be having this massive empathy and this massive um, uh, humanity score still. And I'm sitting here going, how can you just blow a guy's brains out and not take a penalty for that? How can you not lose part of yourself in just being like, well, you know, whatever. He's just a piece of meat, and I'm just going to blow his brains out, you know? So I know that we had customized in our in-house rules for if you're just going to take a life with like no reason, or you're gonna do like you're gonna to torture somebody for you know days or weeks or whatever, and not feel anything about it, your, your humanity's got to take a, a huge dump. 
Yeah, my answer usually when somebody says well, I should be able to do that is to say how many people have you killed recently? Yeah, but I mean... Uh, in a large sense it is a game com complex, but you know, you have to train people in a military to kill. And you have to break certain human inhibitions in many ways. You know, I have two friends who were snipers and working and talking to them about, you know, how their brains have had to work that disassociation is really fascinating. They're great guys, quite as nice as people I know, in fact. But you know, they had to work out a disassociation to basically say, okay, see that guy over there in the reticule? Bam. Yeah. Um, I actually have several friends who got back recently, and I've had the same conversation with them, and their, their basic way of saying it was, um, it's even after you go through a lot of training, and everything else to, to deal with it, it's still really rare to look at a guy in the eye and then shoot him in it. Yeah. Well, the thing is is that I don't want to take that away in terms of the violence and so forth. What I want people to do is realize, as with all cyberpunk things, it's about the people in the stories, not the right. tech. And it's about and, what they do with them in the end. Yeah, it's also the difference. It's also actually, at least to me, what the difference between playing cyberpunk and playing um, like D&D &D was. You know, D&D, &D, you kick open the door, and there's an orc guarding a chest. You kill the orc, and you take the chest. I mean, it, it's almost, you know, it's almost like Dungeon Crawl 101. But in Cyberpunk, it's a case of if you kick open the door, and there's, like, a corporate executive sitting there, you don't necessarily just shoot him in the head and be done with it. Yeah, well, the thing of it is is that there's a specific reason why it's dehumanized to be an orc. You know, mm -hmm. you're not thinking about the orc going home to his wife and kids. You're not thinking about it because there's not as much of a link to you and that orc as a person to person. And, you know, I think that's a very important thing when you're dealing with, you know, dungeon crawling and so forth like that. But we're not really talking about dungeon crawling when we talk about cyberpunk. We're talking about human stories. We're talking about, you know, what is it to be on that edge? What choices do you make? And, again, it's not the technology. It's about what you do with it and how it basically changes you. And, you know, as long as you keep that in mind, it always works. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think that I think that really does kind of um, succinctly cover um, Cyberpunk and what it, what it truly is about. Um, if, uh, if the uh, Mechaton Zero um, uh, Kickstarter goes really well, do you think that you'll also put uh, Cyberpunk through the Kickstarter? Probably not. To be honest, we're doing the Kickstarter in some respects because we wanted to try out new ideas. We wanted to see how interested people were in them. And above me on money, the Kickstarter really is a good way to tell what people like of your products, and it gives you tremendous feedback. You know, I'm going to get off here, and I'm going to go back over, and there'll be people with comments all up and down the board about what we're doing. And I will be able to, almost as though I've had a play test, get a really good sense of what do you want to see with a project. Um, one of the things I love about Kickstarter is that, you know, all of these crowdfunded pieces give you a level of interactivity with your audience that you normally would not get, and that's really neat. No, that's I think that's I think that's actually one of the best things about Kickstarter is is that you really can get a deal for or get a feel for what your audience wants and is looking for. Yeah. Well, they become, rather than you know, an abstract market or distribution or whatever, they become the people who you know, are going to be coming to you at a con and talking to you. And you get a chance to ask them early, well, what do you think? Like I said, I would not have immediately thought that the role-playing aspects were so big in this situation. I would have thought, yeah, they'll want more mecha. So I was frankly surprised and really pleased, too. Yeah, well, it's nice to know that it's, you're not just another mecha combat game that's out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I do have wave-offs here because we're running a bit later than we planned. So okay. any last couple questions you want to ask me? Okay. Um, I did get uh, somebody asking, considering it is 2013, are you going to be doing anything for Cyberpunk? Uh, we're doing Chromebook right now. Okay. So I figure that, that kind of uh, clinches yep. that. Um. I've also been thinking about starting a new column in our website called Cyber 2020 is Closer Than You Think, where I talk about some of the differences and things that actually are coming to pass, because I think it's a pretty good warning for everyone. Okay, and I got it, two, You probably need to learn about it. Okay, I got two last questions for you from, uh, from our viewers. 
Um, one is, do you still own the rights to Interface Magazine, and is there any chance that it's going to get started again? Uh, we actually never owned the rights to Interface Magazine. We just published it for them. Uh, they, the team put it together and did it by themselves, and we published it. But um, interestingly enough, we've been talking to some of the Interface guys, and it may happen again. Don't know at this time. Okay, and the last question is this. Um, the little-known game Go Dice. Go um, Dice. Yep, Go Dice. Out of all things, people are asking about Go Dice. Um, is, there a is there a chance that we're going to see more publications of that, and is there any chance that you're going to be branching out into more of a board game aspect? Yeah, actually, uh, one of the cool things that's happened in the last year, and you'll see this with Mecton Zero, as a matter of fact, is um, you can now have dice designed to have faces the way you want them. And one of the problems with Go Dice is in the furthest version of it, I wanted to basically have special faces that did certain things. And hmm. so and now I'm, I'm actually looking at a redesign of Go Dice with new faces besides the normal sixes. Because that was one of the problems. I wanted to actually get what you call a holographic level to it, a level where a face could mean not just a number, but also a value or a capability. So now we can do that. So yeah, I'm looking forward to doing Go Dice because it's it's a really great bar game. <laughs> we took yeah, it well, around and we left it. We we um, put copies and so forth in coffee shops all over the Seattle area, and it was great. People would you know be out there messing with it and having a good time. That's awesome. All right. Do you have any last minute statements that you want to give to us? Well, drop on by the site, the Kickstarter. Drop on by our website at uh, Archalsorian, and basically visit us, talk to us, we'll answer our questions, and uh, meanwhile, go out, have a good time, and game a lot, okay? Oh, and uh, one last thing. Uh, we talked about it privately, and I just want to see if you know anyone else wants to hear about it. Uh, Gen Con. Gen Con. Don't know yet. Uh, I'm splitting time with the marketing department, the CDPR, which means I could be in Poland then. I could be at Gen Con with them. Any number of things could be happening. And then on top of it, I have to answer to my own crew over here because the Talsorian crew wants to get together at Gen Con this year. I'd love to do it. So stay tuned. When I know, I'll let you guys know. All right. Thank you very much for driving by. I appreciate everybody who actually stuck with us through all the immense tech problems that we had tonight. Um, hopefully, we will be able to do another one of these with Mike because... It's Mike, and he's awesome to talk to. And if you have not enjoyed this, there's I something that's that. really wrong with you. <laughs> so um, I want to thank Mike for his time and for coming out to speak with us. And um, thank you for that. Okay. Take care, Dave. And hope I'll see you at Gen Con. Hopefully you will. And remember, if you want to come and check out uh, myself and uh, Nighthawk Games, we'll be showing off our two games, Dragon Chess and Rampaging Titan. You'll be able to catch us at the first exposure booth. Okay. Catch you later. Yep. Bye. Bye. And that also goes for the rest of you guys. So we will be at Nighthawk Games itself. We'll actually be at Gen Con 2013. We will be showing off our two games, Dragon Chess and Rampaging Titan. Uh, both games are pretty much complete. It's a case of we want to make sure that what we have produced is what you want to play, and we can't do that without your feedback. So it's a free-to-play. It's not one of the pay events that you have to do over at Gen Con, but if you guys want to come out and check us out, we would love to have you. Give us your honest opinion. Remember, the games don't get better unless you tell us what you like and what you don't like about them. So if you come on out, we will be more than happy to speak with you guys. Um, this will actually conclude tonight's broadcast of Gamers on Games, the live edition. This was our interview with Mike Pondsmith of our Talsorian Games and, of course, our own personal announcement. And uh, we look forward to hearing and talking with you guys more in the future. Again, we apologize for all the tech uh, problems that we did encounter tonight. Uh, this is kind of a rarity. We usually don't have these sort of issues, but hopefully we will have this all cleared up. Um, and we will spread this uh, interview around for your personal enjoyment. Uh, that being said, we will call it night, and we hope everyone else has a good time gaming out there. Good weekend, everyone. <laughs>